We gather to celebrate life, to connect deeply, to come to know ourselves and each other in ways we couldn't have dreamt of. May we learn to recognize and affirm the possibilities that surround us in community. We all bring bits of good. May we encourage joy and love in one another rather than seek control. May we enable one another rather than control and possess and feel envy. May our gathering bring from us our calling, our calling to bring love and justice to this world. Each of us is indispensable for this calling, for this work of community. If we are to minister to a broken and wounded world, it will only be together that we will mend the world and make it whole. Good morning and welcome. Let me add my welcome. I'm Reverend Bob LaValle, and I'm happy to be here with you all this morning and with our worship leader, Raven Reed Starr, and our song leader, Dave Ed Edwards. Our music director, Susan Peck, is taking a well-deserved Sunday off, and our senior minister, Reverend Angela Herrera, is on sabbatical until June. The person that you just saw speaking welcome us into this sacred space is our guest preacher today, Reverend Joel Miller. Reverend Joel is the interim minister at All Souls Indianapolis. He's a graduate of the Star King School of Ministry in Berkeley, California, and his ministry includes opening and serving the Columbine UU Church in the Denver area for seven years, <clears throat> serving as the senior minister in Buffalo, New York for 11 years, and serving as an interim minister for five different UU congregations since 2011. Reverend Joel has been my mentor and good friend for many years. <clears throat> he shaped me during my formation, still does. Uh, in fact, he gave the blessing at my ordination in 2018. So if you think I'm a decent minister, you can thank Joel. And if you think I'm a lousy minister, well, Joel's right here. <laughs> Our DJ today is Arnie Golarud. Our tech team is Chris Paul, Erica and Alex, Johnson Jimenez, Bill Miller, and Cy Schuster. Thank you to everyone for making this service possible. Raven has an announcement. Good morning. Today's sermon discusses how our spiritual journey might be impacted by addiction and recovery. If you or someone you have someone you know have been affected by addiction, please consider joining the Addiction Recovery Ministry Breakout Room immediately following the service. Watch for the Zoom link during the credits at the end of the service. We light our chalice as deep calls to deep. Joy calls to joy. Light calls to light. As we light this chalice, may its flame remind us that we are called to something beyond ourselves and that there always is within us an inner light of love, a piece of hope. And may we remember that as one flame lights another, no flame grows the less for being shared. We pledge ourselves now to be bearers of this light, this love, wherever we are, and say yes to the call to life. Will you join me in singing? hymn 1040 in the turquoise hymnal. And as we sing this song, hush, hush, somebody's calling my name. Join with me in visualizing marching alongside the fallen souls on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma. 
Hush, hush, somebody's calling my name. Hush, hush, somebody's calling my name. Hush, hush, somebody's calling my name. Oh, my Lord, oh, my Lord, what shall I do? Sounds like freedom. Somebody's calling my name. Sounds like freedom. Somebody's calling my name. Sounds like freedom. Somebody's calling my name. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord, what shall I do? It sounds like justice. Somebody's calling my name. It sounds like justice. Somebody's calling my name. It sounds like justice. Somebody's calling my name, oh my Lord, oh my Lord, what shall I do? Soon, one morning, death come creeping in my room. Soon, one morning, death come creeping in my room. Soon. One morning, death come creeping in my room. Oh, Lord, oh, my Lord, what shall I do? I'm so glad trouble don't last always. I'm so glad. Trouble don't last always. I'm so glad. Trouble don't last always. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. What shall I do? Hush. Hush. Somebody's calling my name. Hush. Hush, somebody's calling my name. Hush, hush, somebody's calling my name. Oh, my Lord, oh, my Lord, what shall I do? Whoa. Good morning. I'm Mia Noren, the Director of Religious Education. One of the things we teach in religious education for children are the Unitarian Universalist principles, but we use simplified language designed for kids so that they can more quickly grasp the meanings. Last month, we began saying these principles together as we light our chalice. Later on during the class, we talk about which principles the lesson relates to. We've added a children's version of the proposed eighth principle, and besides appreciating its purpose, use it to explain how you use have a voice and can use their vote for change. Please enjoy this recording of one class sharing the children's principles during the chalice lighting. Ms. Ann, would you light the chalice as we say our principles? Each person is important. Kind and fair in all you do. We're free to learn together. We search for what is true. All people need a voice. Build a fair and peaceful world. We take care of our planet. We work together 
for diversity and against racism and oppression. Thank you, everybody. I want to tell you an old story. It comes from a long time ago. It's a story about a fellow named Jonah. Now, Jonah was one of those people who sometimes found himself in conversations with God. This is a story from what we call the Jewish scripture. Some folks called it the Old Testament. So it was pretty common for folks to talk with God, although perhaps not as common as maybe they thought. Certainly today, we get a little nervous if somebody says they're talking with God. But Jonah was, Jonah was a farmer. He was just growing food and enjoying his neighborhood and trying to stay out of trouble. Well, he had a conversation with God and God said, Jonah, you have a calling and you have a gift. I want you to go to Nineveh. I want you to go to Nineveh and talk to the people there. They have been very unkind to one another. They're suffering because of their unkindness. Go. They need to hear you. Jonah was like, I don't want to go to Nineveh. It's a long way away and I've got to get on a boat and I hate boats. And so he talked to his, talked to his wife. God said, I should go to Nineveh. And his wife said, God said, you go to Nineveh. You should go. I don't want to go. Go on, go, go. She said, you've got to, you've got to go. <sighs> Jonah went down to the seaport in Jaffa. He saw a boat for Nineveh. There it was, ready to go. He had his money for the ticket. And then he saw another boat and he said, hey, what's that boat? And a sailor walking by said, that's the boat to Tarshish. Jonah thought, maybe if I get on that boat, it'll be okay. And he got on the boat to Tarshish. Well, of course it wasn't okay. He wasn't going to Nineveh. The boat to Tarshish sailed off. It was on, on the sea, sailing. And then a great storm came up. The water started to, the, the way, big waves came. The water was, had white caps on the top of the waves. It was very upsetting and disturbing. The sailors and the captain were all worried about what does this mean? What is going on? And the waves got bigger and the lightning began to hit the sea. And Jonah had gone and hidden at the bottom of the boat under the deck because he'd felt a little tired. And he thought maybe if he was under the deck, God wouldn't see him and then he wouldn't have to go to Nineveh. Sailors and the captain were worried. They started throw, they, they were carrying valuable goods because they were going to Tarshish and they started throwing crates of stuff overboard. They were afraid the boat would sink. The captain went down into below deck and saw Jonah sleeping there. He said, you get up, help us. We're gonna, we're, we're gonna sink if we don't get this stuff off. They threw everything they could off and it was still dangerous. The seas roaring, the lightning striking everywhere. The captain said, everybody, pray to your gods. It's the only way we're going to make it now. And then Jonah realized, oh. And he said, this is my fault. I was supposed to go to Nineveh. And now we're on a I'm on a boat to Tarshish. Um, they, everybody looked at him like, what are you doing? He said, um, maybe you should throw me off. And the sailors were like, oh, no, 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 no. And the captain's like, oh, we, no, we're not that kind of people. Big wave crashed over the boat. Here you go. Whoa! They threw him over the edge. A big whale came up, swallowed Jonah whole. Didn't chew him or anything, just swallowed him whole. And into the belly of the whale went Jonah. Well, he was there for three days and three nights, swimming in fish guts and half digested fish. And it was really gross and stinky. Jonah was, yeah, I know, I know, I was supposed to go to Nineveh. I don't want to go to Nineveh. I mean, who am I to say anything to anybody? I just want to go home. Finally, Jonah said, all right, all right, I'm going to Nineveh. I go to Nineveh, I do what I'm called to do. Suddenly, the whale started to move, and all of a sudden, the mouth of the whale opened up, and puked Jonah right, on to, right out onto the beach in the sand, along with a bunch of fish guts. Actually says that in the Old Testament, it barfed him out. 
Oh, there was Jonah. And there was Nineveh not too far away. He could see it up the hill. He walked up the hill and went to Nineveh. He approached the front gates. The guards were at the gates looking at him like, what? One of the guards said, what do you want here? Disgusting person covered with fish guts. Jonah said, God sent me here. I'm supposed to talk to you all. The guards looked at each other. Fish guts, message from God, weird guy. Yeah, probably. And they opened the door for him and let him in. Well, he got into the middle of the city square of Nineveh and started explaining to everybody, when you treat each other badly, you all feel bad. And when you all feel bad, then you start treating each other worse. It's a bad cycle. You don't have to live like this. I'm here to tell you that. Now, usually if somebody gets on a street corner these days and starts preaching, you know, everybody just kind of walks by like, yeah, okay, do what you gotta do. But in those days, if you were covered with fish guts and preached, in the middle of the city square, people figured you had something to say. And indeed, they listened and the king heard about this preaching and the king came out from the palace and listened and the king said, you know what? He's right. We don't have to live like this. We could tell each other the truth. We can be kind to one another. We can fulfill our promises to love each other in this world. So the king ordered everyone to stop work for a day and to think about how they would make amendments to one another. A big word there, amendments. Basically, how would they make things better? How would they apologize for the things they had done and instead live to love one another? Jonah listened to this and he thought, what, that doesn't, these people are no good. They haven't listened to a word I said, and he stomped up to the top of the mountain overlooking the, the city of Nineveh and sat down under a tree. He watched the city, and sure enough, everybody took off their fancy clothes, just wore their oldest raggedy clothes, and started making amends. And well, Jonah just didn't believe it. He said, God, you should send lightning down and kill them all. They're just no good people. God sent lightning down instead and burned up the tree Jonah was sitting under. Jonah was like, what? God said, I gave you a tree to make you comfortable. And what do you do? You're just angry, you wanna kill everybody. They're no different than you. Jonah sat and sulked. He didn't like the answer. Hopefully you and I can find different answers if we were to be in the story ourselves. Will you join me in the spirit of meditation? We'll pause the chat for a few moments during the meditation and the prayer. We'll be turning it back on, of course, for the joys and concerns. So I invite you to find a comfortable seat. <sighs> Let's inhale our shoulders up to our ears and exhale, soften down. Inhale up, exhale down. One last time, inhale up, exhale down. Turn your attention to your breath. Don't try to change it or control it. Simply be a witness to your breath. Feel where your breath occurs in your body. And if that's hard, you can place a hand on your chest or your belly. And that spirit of observation will sit together in holy silence for two minutes.
wise person once said that a burden shared is halved and a joy shared is multiplied. Our community is strengthened when we help each other bear our burdens as well as celebrate our joys. Please use the chat bar to share what is on your heart and to support others as they share what is on theirs. If you are not able to write in the chat bar, please contact the church office or send an email to caring at uuabq.org. The video will prompt us first to share our joys and then our concerns. share our joys and concerns. We share our lives, really. We share the joys simple and profound for tea and daffodils, singing of the birds, the supportive community, the joy of our non-human companions, the turning of the, the planet towards spring, vaccines, and concerns, concerns with the struggles to live day by day, month by month, year by year, the big questions and little that make it work sometimes to live. Concerns for family members and friends who have, who are struggling with illness of all sorts. We lift up Kenny Jones's children who were diagnosed with COVID and uh, we wish for a peaceful growth into this new administration. 
All these joys and concerns and those joys and concerns held in our hearts, unspoken but no less keenly felt, we lift them all up to the great powers of celebration and healing and renewal that are known by many names. Let's join our hearts in prayer. We remember and lift up Jerry Noble as she prepares for surgery this week. May all go well. May her recovery be comfortable and swift. And may she and her loved ones know that they are lifted up on the love of this congregation. We pray for all who mourn the passing of loved ones, whether they are recent losses or losses from the past that still echo in our hearts. May we all find comfort and peace. We lift up the healthcare community who have worked so hard for so long on behalf of the common good. As we give, th give, as we give thanks to the many gifts that they bring, may we honor their efforts by continuing to be disciplined in our attempts to contain this deadly contagion. We give thanks for this gathered community. May our minds and hands and hearts be united to carry each other in good times and bad. We pray for the planet. May our leaders recognize that water is life. May we see what's beautiful and holy in our communities. May we see what's beautiful and holy in each other. May we see what's beautiful and holy in ourselves. And may we all be held in the heart of love. Peace be with you.
this morning is Against Dying by Kaveh Akbar. Kaveh Akbar was born in Tehran, Iran, and currently teaches at Purdue, Purdue University. He writes this poem from the perspective of a Muslim working on his sobriety. If the body is just a parable about the body, if breath is a leash to hold the mind, then staying alive should be easier than it is. Most sick things become dead things. At 24, my liver was already covered in fatty rot. My mother filled a tiny coffin with picture frames. I spent the year drinking from test tubes, weeping wherever I went. Somehow it happened that wellness crept into me, like a roach nibbling through an eardrum. For a time, the half minutes of fire in my brain stem made me want to pull out my spine, but even those have become bearable. So how shall I live now in the unexpected present? I spent so long in a lover's quarrel with my body. The peace seems overcautious, too polite. I say, stop being cold or make that blue bluer, and it does. We speak to each other in this code where every word means obey. I sit under a poplar tree with a thermos of chamomile, feeling useless as an oath against dying. I put a sugar cube on my tongue and swallow it like a pill. Long ago, it was after a board meeting a board meeting at the Columbine Unitarian Universalist Church in Littleton, Colorado. I had arrived there just weeks before that meeting. I'd arrived there to help the folks who had started a church, that church just um, two months before that. We had board meetings. We were planning where to meet, how to, how to make sure we had religious education, how to do music. There was so much to talk about. After the meeting, Dottie stayed for a while. Dottie wanted to talk to me. Dottie and I were getting to know each other pretty fast. Everybody in the church was getting to know one another pretty fast. It's a lot of work to start a congregation. And when Dottie pulled me aside, she said, Joel, I've been coming here for two months now but I still feel like I'm looking through a window in at everybody else. I'm outside, they're inside. I don't feel like I'm in the in-group. And, and you know what? Everybody here is a Christian. We talked a little more about how she was feeling. And then the very next day, after the religious education meeting, Alex, another member who was helping to start the congregation, he took me aside after the RE meeting. And he said, Joel, you know, Joel, I feel like there's an in-group here and an out-group. And I feel like I'm in the out-group. And you know something? Everybody here is an atheist. There wasn't an in-group or an out-group. The church was so new. Everybody was so new to each other. And the other thing about beliefs, there were as many beliefs there as there were members. No, I take that back. There were at least there was at least one more belief than there were people in the sanctuary on Sunday because I, I, I'm not sure what I believe. I go back and forth. Everyone was new. Dottie, Alex, everybody on the board, everybody in the RE committee, everybody there on Sunday. But they were surprised. They had come to church expecting to connect, but they were feeling lonely somehow. I've seen this. I've seen it happen in every congregation I've served, all 10 of them. I've seen it in the three congregations where I was a lay member. It's surprising. After connecting deeply with a congregation, with a community, to feel a sense of loneliness. It happens for people who grow up in a church. It happens for those who found the church after leaving another religious group. 
It happens to longtime active members with hundreds of good friends. We go to church to be connected. And we do connect. I hope we connect. And somehow this unexpected loneliness. There is a difference. It's not the raw loneliness of, say, a, a thoughtful, sensitive child growing up in a restrictive and punishing religion. It's not the aching loneliness of a lost friend or a faraway home. It's not that scary, uncomfortable loneliness of going to a church for the first time and no one talks to you. This is a different loneliness. This is the loneliness that comes after we have connected, after we've made friends and found ways to live our lives for love, to say yes to it. I didn't understand about this loneliness until after I had been a few years working on my recovery from addiction. I'm an alcoholic myself, always working to grow sober. And I haven't had a, an alcoholic drink in over 29 years. I'm grateful for those years. Some of us who are addicts describe our journeys as um, one from addiction to recovery and sobriety. And yet, and yet, I have good friends. I have family that loves me. I have colleagues who are very good to me. I love the, that I get to do ministry. I have this practice of 12 steps. It keeps me connected to myself, to the world and life around me, to something that's greater than me. I'm grateful for all this. And in my really good moments, it's the good moments that I feel most that sense of loneliness. Something's not quite right. So I mentioned that I'm in a program, I'm working on recovery, my recovery, working on becoming more and more sober every day. I follow a set of steps, there are 12 of them. The majority of those steps are actually a spiritual practice of making amends. And I work on these steps every day. These steps, they include understanding harm that I have caused to others. And it happens. We're human and we all cause harm. We recognize, I recognize the harm I've caused. I try to understand what I did. And then the next step I do is to tell someone about what I did, what, what harms I caused. I try to understand them. Then I become responsible for them. Then I become willing to go to those I've hurt, to apologize and make amends. And then I go to them. I apologize. And if it's at all possible, I find a way to repair or repay the harm I've caused. I'm grateful for that. It's spiritual work. The thing about this work is it only goes one way. So I'm not asking anything back from the people who I, I go to meet with and to whom I want to make amends. I don't expect forgiveness from them. I don't judge them. It's my responsibility to make amends for what I have broken, for what harm I have caused. And what comes out of doing that over and over again is that I recover more and more of the integrity of my own life. I find more joy. I'm more capable of love, of receiving it and giving it. I like the story of Jonah a lot. It feels like a good companion story to the work of making amends for me. I like to tell the story and it reminds me that I too have run from things in my life I've been called to do. 
I've had those moments when I've felt like I was in the belly of a whale swimming in fish guts. I've had those moments when I've been sitting atop a mountain looking down on others in judgment. I, I've been doing a lot of that recently. I, I don't like myself, especially when I do that. And I know I've gotten there when I start a rant about Vladimir Putin or Xi Jinping or Donald Trump. I really just start, you know what? I just start resenting these guys. And you know, the thing about resentment is that then I start resenting the people who voted for them. I resent the people who trade with them. I, the resentment makes me ugly. I don't want to be the person I become when I'm judging others in anger. And I recognize those moments best when I think about, oh, if there really was a God and we'll just zap that sucker with a lightning bolt. And then like in the story of Jonah, actually I've had my own moments when I probably deserved a lightning bolt. The steps remind me that if I foster resentment within me, it's like drinking poison, thinking that the person I resent is gonna die from the poison. It's the hardest spiritual work I've ever done. It requires that I be painfully honest. And I have to look at the most unattractive parts of myself, the parts where I have gone to Tarshish instead of Nineveh, and I've been lucky. I've had my own version of sailors throwing me over the overboard and get so I can be swallowed by the whale. I've had whale moments where I've been in, in the belly for weeks, months, years even. Long time to be covered by fish guts, stewing in my own resentments. And it's hard then get barfed out of it all, walk up to someone feeling like I'm covered in the fish guts and make amends for what I've done. And it's embarrassing. I don't want somebody to see me this way with resentments, having to repair some harm I've caused. But you know, those steps, hard as they can be, after I do them, after I mend the world, in the, for what I it, mend the world in response to how I've harmed it. I find myself more open to connection, more open to love. Partly it's just because I'm so relieved. I had all this energy I was carrying, trying to ignore what I'd done. Instead, I, I mend it. And I connect more deeply. I connect deeply, more powerfully. You know, our seventh principle is not just nice words. It's not just about flowers and bees. It's about how we are connected or not connected. And when we break the connections between us, damage them, fill them with resentment or anger, we feel it. I feel it. And it is a lonely, broken feeling. That kind of feeling being ignored when you walk into a church for the first time, that feeling when you're homesick or someone you love has died or you realize you've got to find a new way to live in life. Making amends can mend those experiences of loneliness. And you know, after having made the amends, it feels like I washed the fish guts off of me. It's worth it. But then there's that unexpected loneliness. The loneliness Dottie lamented back in the Columbine church those years ago. She felt like she was outside looking in. She was as in as anybody could be in the congregation. We are called, something calls us to be more than we are. That's my experience more than just making amends. We have to make the amends if we will hear that other call. It calls us to love the world. 
Dottie understood this. She came to understand it after, after a few weeks. She realized what I've just said to you, that she was no more in or out than anybody else. She understood she was called, called to a love so powerful that she understood why she had helped to start a church in a spiritual tradition she barely knew. She was a new Unitarian Universalist. I've shared this story many times with her permission. Those steps I've taken open me to the call of love. The love that speaks to us through this unexpected loneliness. The kind of love our world needs in times of broken promises, of anger, of resentment. We live in a time of great resentments. This is when the world needs that kind of love that pulls us out of ourselves and reconnects us to each other and to the world. The love that mends the broken web of life. Every moment of life is a chance to answer that surprisingly lonely message of love. Mend the world. Mend it far beyond yourself. Mend the lives of people you don't know. Of beings very different than you. Mend the world through service. Mend the world searching for truth and love. This is our living tradition. This is our way in the web of life. Spirit of life and love are always calling us. Let us gather. Let us gather first to mend what is broken among us, within us. And then let us gather in service and the search for truth. To love a world that needs it that love a world that can be so much more than it is. Our change for the future recipient for February, March, and April is the American Civil Liberties Union of New Mexico. The ACLU of New Mexico protects and advances justice, liberty, and equity as guaranteed by the constitutions of New Mexico and the United States. It is especially focused on groups that have been historically disenfranchised. You can make an offering online by clicking on the link that we'll put in the chat box. If you'd prefer not to give online, you can always simply mail a check to the church and include change for the future in the memo line. Now let us exercise the enduring power of generosity.
what is generously given is received with gratitude. Thank you on behalf of First Unitarian Church of Albuquerque, and thank you on behalf of the American Civil Liberties Union of New Mexico. As we approach the end of our service, you're invited to stay for our, our virtual coffee hour in our breakout rooms. Just stay till the end of the credits and we'll place you in a room where you can have a conversation. And whether you're having conversations there or around your kitchen table or wherever today, I have a little prompt based on our sermon. I'm wondering, has anyone ever made amends to you? Have you ever made amends to someone else? I'm putting that prompt in the chat. And let's bring Joel on to for our benediction and chalice lighting. Extinguishing, pardon me. May we hear in the call of love, the patience, the serenity, to accept there, there are things we cannot change. And may the call of love speak to us uncomfortably to know the, the things we can change. And in community, may the love we share help us know the difference. Take the light of your gathering. Take the light from that chalice. Carry it with you. The world needs it. The world needs you. Go in peace. Be in peace. <laughs>